This is John Quelch, the Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School, and it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, our first uh, Distinguished Leader Fireside Chat after the uh, uh, summer break. Uh, and we're absolutely thrilled today to have uh, the benefit of uh, having as our guest Carlos Brito, who for 15 years uh, was the uh, the head of uh, AB InBev uh, as CEO and uh, recently stepped down from that role. And uh, we're absolutely thrilled to have uh, Carlos with us as one of uh, Brazil's leading business people uh, of the last uh, uh, decade. So Carlos, thank you so much for being with us. And let, let me uh, start because I think we want to really focus on leadership uh, heavily in our discussion this evening. And I'd like to start off with just a very simple question. And that is, you know, what makes a good leader? Hi, John, great to be here. Thanks for having me. I think, uh, you know, leaders are, when you think about business, you need three things to succeed pretty much, you know, you need leadership, you need to know which business you're in, you need to know about your business, and you need to have some kind of management system. Those three things gets you in business. In my experience, leadership's like 70% of the weight of these different factors. And leadership for me, I learned from my interactions with Pepsi and so many people through the years, we've been Pepsi Baltimore for so many years. And we can, we can pretty much divide it in three buckets. Leadership is about you know, achieving consistent results better than your peers, first. Second, with the people, so everything that has to do with team building, motivating people, inspiring people, recruiting, promoting, growing people, and all that. So with the people. Third, doing it the right way. So ethical, ethically, no shortcuts, you know, building something to last and doing it the right way. So these are things I think when I think of leaders. And you can always tell a good leader by, for example, the quality of his or her team. You know, whenever we were talking about leaders, you look at the team that the person is building and leaders believe in the power of great teams and talented teams. And you look at a team, if it's a strong team, that tells something about that leader that, of that team. If not, you better have a second look. Right. So, so leadership is, for you, clearly a team sport, right? Yeah, because the definition for us of a leader is somebody who is in a position from which for you to achieve your goals, you need a team effort to get there. Mm -hmm. If you're just somebody working on an Excel sheet, doing some analysis, you might be a leader, innate leader, but in that position, you're not in a leadership position. You don't need the team to conclude what you're trying to achieve. But if you're in a position where to get there, you need a group of people with you to get to that objective and you are, the top guy in that group, then you are in a leadership position. And then you should form that team. You should believe in the power of teams. You should inspire the team. You should convince the team that they can do more than they think they can. And you should make that magic that one plus one equals more than two, because now it's the power of complementarity. One helping the other and complementing the other. How do you, as a leader, make sure that you choose people who are going to complement your skills as opposed to uh, cloning yourself? That's very important. I think that has to do a little bit with bias. That's something that people more and more talk about it than conscious bias. If you don't watch out, you tend to hire people that are similar to you because it's more comfortable, you know? But the conversation is easier. The guy went to the same university as you went to or college, likes the same kind of things you like, you know, and comes from, a, the same region. So you have to be very careful that you choose people using meritocracy, using you know potential, curiosity, ethics, leadership, so many other things that you need to look at and you need to really check your bias. Otherwise you end up with a team of everybody very much alike and that's not very effective because the good decisions come out of the positive tension of having different points of view. If everybody gets into a room to discuss, especially when you're talking about complex issues, if people agree in five minutes, as opposed to taking, let's say, half an hour or one hour of discussion, that five-minute decision is not as good, I bet, as that one-hour 
discussion, tension, constructive tension that led you to a better decision because different points of view were brought to the table. And you can only do that if you build a team that have that diverse background and experiences being brought to the table. So if you were hiring a, a vice president, not a direct report, but if a vice president was being recruited at AB InBev, how many people would that person typically interview with uh, before uh, a selection was made in order to deal with this uh, potential bias problem? Well, first, we, we, you know, I'm not trying to be cute here, but I'll answer the question. But before that, let me tell you that, and again, I, 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 I stepped down from ABI, but it's an awesome company. I spent 32 years of my life there. At ABI, we wouldn't be hiring normally a VP directly from the market. Mm -hmm. We'd be hiring right. trainees. We'd be hiring MBAs. We'd be hiring people out of college and developing them through, you know, the company. And they would grow with us and stay with us for a long period of time. But if I was hiring a VP directly, and even for, you know, a trainee, they would be interviewed by three to five people, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. So judgment is expressed in terms of the quality of the team. The good judgment of a leader is expressed uh, through the quality of her team. Among other things, yes. Yes. You haven't yet mentioned uh, the attribute courage. How is courage important to leadership? Well, I think, uh, especially when you talk about COVID, you know, let's say, you know, the last year, year and a half, I mean, there was no playbook for COVID, right? It was very hard for you to say, oh, yeah, that reminded me of that crisis. The world went through the financial crisis of 2008. No, 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 no. This was the last one was, was 100 years ago. That was even similar to this one. The world's a very different place. So I think to have the courage to be able to be able to continue to have your business running, but putting the safety of your people, of your colleagues, first and foremost, that blend, I'm not sure courage is the right word, but that resolve, that idea that it can be done, the and as opposed to the or, I think it's another thing that good leaders do. Leaders bring clarity to situations. So when at ABI, we, we saw first what was happening in China because we have a big business in China, John, as you know, that's how we met in China. Uh, China was first affected by COVID and our people put our safety of our people first, business continuity, our consumers and communities and so on. And by learning from their experience, when it became a global pandemic, then we translated, quote unquote, all those learnings in different ways of running the business because of social distancing, how to get the brewers to work, the distribution, the trucks and everything. And we put that everywhere. So we brought clarity early on and we said, those are the priorities. That's what's important for us. And whenever we had a problem in one site, again, prioritizing the safety of our people, we would shut down the place, put everybody in quarantine. We invested way more than the local regulations because that was a clear priority. So leaders do that as well. They bring clarity. Leaders are also that kind of people that can look at a very complex situation and boil it down after analysis and judgment to simple steps. So a broader group of people can really execute those steps. It doesn't mean that the leader is smarter than the other people. It just means that the, the other people are busy and they don't have the same information as the leader and his or her team has to make those analyses. But this idea that a leader is, 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 is capable of going straight to what's key, focus on what's key, and in spreading that action plan, coming with a simple action plan, even for a complex situation, that's also a great leader. Uh, if, if we were to look, uh, for example, at the um, uh, integration of AB with InBev, uh, the, the acquisition of AB, just for a moment, um, some people would say that that was a very courageous move uh, for InBev, but someone else might say that if you went through the level of anal analysis uh, that you've just described, that actually the, the decision ends up not being as courageous uh, simply because it's been so well 
analyzed and understood and uh, rehearsed. Um, can you comment on that? Did you at the time view uh, and did uh, the bosses of uh, InBev view this decision as being an incredibly courageous and bold move? Yes. I mean, I'm not sure courageous is the word we use, but bold is something we use. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it describes better the situation because you're right. It requires a lot of planning, pre-rehearsal, trying to think of different scenarios. It took us a long time to press the button because again, it was a different country. We had hardly any operations in the US. It was an iconic brand. Uh, it was an unsolicited, um, as it's well-documented, it was an unsolicited move. We knew them for many years, but at the end, we, we decided it was time to just let the board know, their board know of our intention. Mm -hmm. So there was a letter that was sent. And of course, the reaction to that letter was totally unknown. But at the end, John, in one month, situation was resolved. You know, yeah. that surprised us on the other hand. You know, we thought it would yes. be a protracted, you know, media, politics, lots of things involved. There was some of that, but they are great people. And we sat down and we negotiated and in one month we, we, we signed. When you're when you're looking at uh, promoting people, um, and let, let's say you have a couple of uh, a couple of division managers who are, you know, they're both hitting their numbers or beating their numbers consistently. Um, in all respects, on paper, they're equal. What do you look for in character and personality that would warrant one? being promoted. That's what that's what's called, at least in our culture, meritocracy, right? You're trying to, to have a level playing field so the most talented have more exposure, are promoted faster, have are on a fast track type career, and, um, and they also have more wealth creation, right? So that's meritocracy. So what we try to do is at least twice a year, we're looking at people, we're looking at uh, what they're doing, we're doing performance evaluation. We're doing 360 evaluations. We had twice a year formal feedback sessions with all the top people in the company so people know where they stand. What we concluded, John, is that the great talented people, uh, a lot of companies attract those people, but very few people, very few companies will attract, but then keep and develop those people. Attract talented people is easier than keeping them. And what we learned is that talented people like a couple of things. First, they like meritocracy. They like to be judged by what they bring to the table, what their potential is, their leadership, the, the, the way they attract people and form great teams, the delivery, everything they bring to the table as opposed to passports, last names, who they know, politics or anything else, seniority, anything else. Okay, so meritocracy. The other thing they like is candor. An environment where they know where they stand. And things are said, you know, in a civilized fashion, but said in a straightforward manner. Okay, so candor is very important. And uh, for example, when people ask what was important in my career, and we can talk about this if you want, I say feedback, honest, constructive feedback. That, that's what made a difference in my career. Everything else, you know, work hard, opportunities, all that is clear. But in my career, what made a difference was that I always had mentors that were willing to tell me what I needed to hear in a constructive, respectful way, as opposed to what I wanted to hear. So that's another thing they like, candor. Another thing they like is informality. Visibility of challenging openly somebody, because at the end, we want what's best for the business and people not feeling that it's personal. So they also appreciate that. And they also like, you know, to, 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 to be involved in things that have a purpose. They like to be involved in things that are big things and where they can really have a piece of the value creation. So those are some of the things yeah. that we learned along the way. Just, just say a little bit more about meritocracy if you could, uh, Carlos, because I think mo most people would appreciate that word, but not understand the degree to which um, the culture of uh, AB InBev 
you know, promotes people who are very young to very, very significant positions very quickly if they have what it takes. That's right. I'll tell you one story before just to make the, the contrast. When I lived in Belgium with ABI, uh, myself and my wife, we knew a couple that used to work uh, for a big, I'm not going to say the name, but for a big global multinational powerful American company that had their European headquarters in Belgium. And this company had a very different view on how to promote people in meritocracy. I was once in a dinner and this guy told me when our wives went to the bathroom or something, the two of us were at the table and they said, oh, Brito, you know, myself and my wife, we work for company ABC. I said, no, no, yeah, I know, yeah, interesting. And he said, yeah, and my wife is ahead of me professionally. I said, oh, cool, interesting. And, but then what was more interesting, what he said next, he said, and she'll always be. And then I got interested. I said, well, what do you mean? Uh, how do you know? I mean, you guys are so young. And how do you know she'll always be ahead of you professionally? If that matters at all. But how do you know? Now I got curious. And he said, no, because she's class of uh, 1995. And I'm class of 2000. And because she's five years ahead of me, uh, unless she does something really bad, she'll always be ahead of me. And I said, then I didn't know, I, 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 I didn't want to react because I would say how sad. But then the, the wives came back and the, the, the conversation changed. But I reflected how sad to be in a company that because somebody else got five years before you did, that person would normally, in most cases, be always ahead of you. No matter if you're better, if you're delivering more, if you're building amazing teams, if you have any more potential, if you're much more committed, you work harder. But that five years, you cannot change. Yeah. That is something that's you cannot change because the person got there five years before you did. So meritocracy is something that everybody agrees. Okay. When you're at school, everybody agrees with it. You know, but the people that have the best grades have awards, medals, scholarships, they are listed. When you go to sports, the good players play, the not so good players warm the bench. We all think it's obvious, of course. When you got to the company. People try to convince you that all these things are cruel and not the right thing to do. So if John has been there for 25 years and Mary is there for only three, and there's a promotion now, your example, and I can look at both and both can be promoted. And John, because he's been there for 25 years, knows everybody, but Mary is much better. Some people say, but Mary can wait. She's young. She's been there for three years. John has mortgage to pay college kids and all that. I mean, it's John's turn. That's what destroys meritocracy. And then it becomes a game of who knows who or seniority, and that doesn't build a great company. And then what happened is that you end up with a company of Jones and all the Marys go away because the Marys will always be lots of offers in the marketplace. So I, I wish you'd chosen another name than John for this uh, particular example. That's right. I should example. have chosen. I should have. Uh, you know. uh, my. <laughs> um, no, no, but you know what, John? Just complimenting. What you learn in life time and again is that the things that matter are very simple to state, but very hard to live on a daily basis because of all the distractions and pressures to do the other thing as opposed to the right thing, you know? So meritocracy, everybody agrees, but then go practice this on a daily basis and you see how many traps are there and you have to be vigilant all the time. So is meritocracy uh, defined in your terms just in relation to quantitative performance metrics? No. And, if, and if not, how do you factor in soft skills, et cetera, into your um, assessment, into your feedback that you give someone that is nevertheless meritocratic and not conditioned by your own personal biases? Well, first we look at the culture fit. So that for us comes first, even for the numbers. Is this somebody who's a cultural ambassador? Somebody who represents our 10 principles? Who's in our website, by the way? You know, dream people culture, we call it. Is this somebody that really makes decisions based on those principles? Second, the numbers. The third, is this somebody that in the 360 evaluation is seen by peers and people from, and team members as somebody who's really developing something better than we had before? Somebody who's get, who will get this company to a better place. Somebody who people love to work with. People will go to war with. 
is somebody that attracts amazing talent or just uses talent that somebody else has developed. You know, it's just a user, not a producer of talent and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it, it, it's a very complete process and we'll look at different traits because again, it's a very complex thing to define. And it's not always perfect, by the way. Sometimes we look back and say, oh my God, you know, uh, yeah, looking back, I think uh, we are not very good with our bias. I think because this guy works here in the US and we know him or her and meet often compared to that person from Asia, uh, he or she had a preference in that decision. And today looking back, it was not a perfect decision. You know, so we're always looking in the, in the past few years in our, you know, people meetings, as we call it, where we talk about careers and moves, we always have a session at the beginning about bias breaking mm -hmm. mindset. How can you check your bias and break them when the discussion is going that direction that's not the right direction? That's not a meritocratic direction. Is a direction because it's a recency bias. It's somebody who's more like you that you have worked with, yeah. you know? So it's something to be vigilant, but it's so, the right way to do it, meritocracy. Could, could you just talk a little bit about the, the principles that you spoke of that define the uh, AB and BEV culture? Very good. We, we started, when we started 32 years ago, our founders had the, the experience from prior businesses and the certainty that the only competitive advantage that you can have as a business is the people that you attract, retain, develop. And because at the end, we are the company. You know, ABI is 160,000 people. These people are ABI. They make decisions, ABI is making decisions. If they learn, ABI learns. If they are going united into the same, into the same direction, ABI is aligned in around one objective. So in a lot of companies, people always say, oh yeah, we have this problem. We have this problem. Let's wait and see what they will tell us to do, what they will decide. Of course, you have levels of decision, but at the end, we want people to feel this is our company. We own this company. So we are owners and we believe owners make better decisions. So we start with this idea that we are the company. And if you start with this idea, then you go, you got easily to our principles that are very common sense good principles. It's about, since we're people, we are the company, people have dreams, you know, things they want to achieve, things that are stretched, that motivates them. Can we have a dream for the team? Yes, okay, so that's a dream, a big dream. To dream big, you need talented people because talented people are the ones that pursue those big ideas, those big dreams. And you need a lot of skills to get there. And you need these people to behave as owners because we are the company. So there's some other you know, things in there in the 10 principles, but it's basically this. It's a big dream, the best people and the ownership mindset because owners make better decisions. Owners join companies to build on the company's dreams. Professionals join companies to build their resumes. Yes. That's the difference. An owner has the company, the group, first, second, third, and then me. A professional that will be with you for two, three years and then jump to another company and build a, an amazing resume in his view or her view, he or she has himself or herself first and foremost and second and third the company in two years i'll be out of here you know so i'm exaggerating just to make the point i'm not saying this applies to everybody of course not but it is what we've learned that people when they come and they want and they have and they see themselves for the long term they're making decisions that make sense today five years from now ten years from now if you're going to be here for two years or three years because then you go to private equity, then you go to banking, consulting, this and that to build your resume. You're worried about the decision for the next two years. Three, five years, you're not going to be here, right? So even without thinking, that is your mindset. What, what in your own uh, background or upbringing led you to be in the first group? Well, because I was lucky enough to have met these people this group of founders before actually I went to business school in the US. Right. When I went to business school in the US 30 plus years ago, I needed a scholarship. I met this 
Brazilian George Paulo Lemon that you have interviewed in your, in your webinar here a year plus ago. And he, long story short, he decided to pay for my first year MBA. And before I was traveling, I was in Brazil. And he said, when are you going to Stanford? I said, oh, in three weeks time. He said, would you like to get to know our people and culture and stay here for two weeks? And it was a small boutique bank, very, very famous investment bank in Brazil. And I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And I had worked for multinational companies prior to that. Daimler Benz in Germany and Shell Oil in Brazil. Great companies. But when I learned about this company, this small bank with young people, bright people, thinking big, making decisions, agile, you know, small structure, but making big things. I said, wow, <laughs> that was totally different than what I've had experienced prior to that. So I was very lucky that I found that. So after business school, when I had all these offers and Brazil was going through a tough time and my offers are all in the US and Germany, I, I only interviewed with them in Brazil and I decided to join them. At a salary cut to my best offers at the time of 80%. Wow. 80%, okay? But I said, I wanna be part of this group. Everything else was variable, so it was uncertain. But the fix was 80% lower any Brazilian currency. And this was in the 80s. So, and I never looked back. And by the way, I met my wife at the bank as well. So, I mean, I got the scholarship, a career, and the family. So that was great. What, uh, what made Georgie Paolo Lehman such a, an effective mentor? Well, because he's the one person I know that has always believed in the power of people, has been the only truly competitive sustainable advantage of any company, of any thing you want to do. It starts and ends with people. Now everybody believes in that. But 50 years ago, 60 years ago, from what I hear from other people that have been there longer, he was already of that opinion. Imagine that. He was a very famous banker in Brazil, very famous. I was a guy working at Shell Oil, a junior guy, but I had been accepted at Stanford Business School. And at the time, the only accepted one in Brazil, that, that year was me. And I had a scholarship to go to other universities in the US, colleges, but not Stanford. So I, I got in touch with somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew him and asked for an interview so I could sell my case. And he accepted that and spent one hour with me. You know, why? You know, yeah. and then he decided to pay. It was not a loan, it was a scholarship. He gave me a full scholarship on my first year. Mm -hmm. And for the second year, I got a scholarship from the Brazilian government at the time, but uh, later, I got also the news that you, you had paid for my second year as well. So, okay, that put a lot of pressure on me to get that work during the summer and all that to save for my second year. Yeah, coming back to the, uh, the ABN Bev principles again and the culture, um, are you able to successfully screen when you're recruiting people uh, for fit with the culture and with the principles? Uh, or if you make mistakes in hiring, are you able to correct them? Are you able to help people toward appreciating the culture and the principles and they successfully uh, adapt to those? Well, that's why in the previous answer, I said that most of the people we hire, we hire out of college. Yeah. Because when you hire out of college, not only you had the summer internship, prior to your full-time hiring. So you had the opportunity to live with that person for three months, for 10 weeks, whatever the time might be, sometimes two summers. So the risk is much lower for both sides, right? When you hire somebody out of the market, then the risk is much higher because that person comes with 20 years, 10 years experience in a different culture. And the transition can be hard. Not because our culture is the right one and everybody else is wrong, no just that our culture works for us. In that company I just described from Belgium, that American company, that culture of seniority of classes maybe works for them. They are a successful company as well. You know, so, but for us, the people that we attracted came because of our values. So our commitments to keep those values and those values are very similar to what a good student or a good athlete, Michael Phelps yes. would do. Michael yes. Phelps had a big dream. I won seven gold medals. He surrounded himself with the best coach, nutritionists, physiotherapists, whatever, a whole team. It takes a village to get somebody there to that height. And he owned it. 
Nobody was forcing him to do any of that, I bet. He owned it, he wanted to do it. So that's the same we say, you need to have a big dream, the best people, ownership. Yeah. And with that and some other, other things, you can go places. If you have a strong culture, can you more easily decentralize decision-making? Yes. Yes, because you are going to be, you have this basic value set that is shared by everybody. And again, it's never perfect, but we, because we talk about it all the time and people are making decisions based on those principles. Uh, I'm not saying they would be making, making decisions the same as I would be making, but the fact that we talk about it so much make people, you know, think when they're making decisions that it's for the short and long term, it's something that has to be the right thing to do, has to be for the team, you know, that, those things. Owner's decisions, not professional decisions. Could you talk a little bit about a, a, a hiring decision that you made that went wrong? Um, and when you look back on it, can you diagnose the, the error that you made in, in hiring that person? Yeah, that's a very good point because sometimes people put, for example, just an example, people put false deadlines for you to solve a problem, a people problem. And sometimes you, again, you fall into that trap. And the guy comes to you and says, hey, Brito, I need to have this replacement, you know, by X date. I have two guys here, I'd like you to interview the two or three. And, you know, I have my opinion, I'd like to check your opinion, we have to do it. Sometimes you interview the two or three, maybe you don't, you're not amazed by any of them, but because that deadline was put, you, you, you say, man, you know, okay, it's suboptimal, maybe it's not the best, but let's do, let's go with this. And then you regret this later sometimes. And then if you had just asked the question, but well, what do you mean we need to dis decide this by Monday? Well, why Monday? Or why next week? Well, why can't we do the right thing? Even if it takes a month, two months, three months, whatever it takes, you know? And, and again, sometimes you do ask that and you, and you see it's the, that deadline doesn't exist. But some people put that deadline just because of whatever reason, and then some other people fall into that trap. So Got it's it. better not to hire somebody who's substandard, of course, and wait and hire the right person. And sometimes that can take a while. And that's why we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that for the key positions at ABI, we have a bench. So whenever we meet about people chess, as we call, we say, okay, this position here, including the CEO, of course, the CEO will discuss with the board, but yeah. with the CEO's team, the top team, we would discuss all the key positions in the company and say, okay, if this person would disappear for some reason, who would be ready to, to take over now? What about two years? What about five years? In two years, in five years. And sometimes you, you look at the bench, the bench is really, you have a lot of talents. Sometimes not so much. And then you have to start making corrections before you need to be against the wall on a deadline that's not really, didn't need to be there, you know? So we put a lot of emphasis on making sure we have a strong bench. So Got we it. don't have to make those decisions in a time that's not right. Can you talk a little bit about um, um, global versus local uh, in the uh, beer business? Uh, traditionally, uh, beer has been a very local uh, national brand oriented category. And yet you came along and, you know, perhaps leaving aside Heineken, which is a, a premium specialty position beer, you created a global company um, out of an industry that is primarily populated by local brands. How, yeah. how, how, who conceived that idea and why did it work? It's interesting you say that because in the early days, we were just in one country, Brazil, at least the Brazilian side of the company. And um, as we went to different countries, the biggest motivation to go was not scale, was not global brands, was nothing of that, it was people. Because in being in one country, we started attracting all this talented people out of college, trainee program, MBA program. And we said, well, if we stay in one country, the funnel is going to be so narrow that we're going to start, like many companies, losing all the talents to the market. And then 
Marcel tells our CEO then said, well, if we go to another country, then we're gonna create parallel paths. We're gonna be a more interesting company to develop one's career because you can go to Argentina, to Venezuela, you can come back go to Paraguay. So we started in South America and then we saw that our people like it. Our, not only it became a more interesting company to attract and retain people and develop people, but our people were good at integrating businesses. And our culture was one that could travel. We didn't know that. We were thinking, is this a Brazilian culture? Is this a company culture that can travel? And we concluded that yes, this is a culture that can travel because guess what? The Michael Phelps of the world and the good students at University of Miami, they all think the same. They have a big idea. They surround themselves or go to places where they have great people. So they get inspired by and they own that dream of theirs. It's not being forced on them, right? So, but it was good when we went and we found that not everybody would subscribe to the culture, by the way, John, only the minority, but we're looking for that minority that wanted to do great things, not just make hands meet and build a regular company. And in uh, ABN, Bev, therefore, uh, most people who reach the upper levels of the company are people who have uh, worked in multiple uh, geographies, right? Sure. Uh, and also on multiple in multiple functional areas as yes. well? Yes, yes. Well, of course we have specialists, but we also believe in the power of generalists, mm -hmm. people that know the business, that have been in different areas, that have been from sales to marketing to supply chain to you name it, procurement. Of course, I mean, when you talk about a brewmaster, that's a specialist. When you talk about a tax expert, that's another expert. So there are many functions in the company where you do have experts, but many others managerial functions, they are more for generalists. And that's exactly what you said. People that went to different markets, different countries as we became global and different functions, sectors. And as you developed your own career, um, what did you learn along the way about uh, leadership? Um, particularly, what aspect of leadership did you find it most difficult personally to become good at? Of course, the, the, the selecting people is the most difficult one. Because as you said, you know, you know, sometimes you have an interview, sometimes you have some exposure, and based on that and some other facts, you have to make a decision, right? So that's why we try to hire from college, not from the market, right? To diminish that risk that a decision could be wrong. Because if you hire from the market, you don't have the necessary exposure to really make a good judgment. But if somebody worked with you for one summer, two summers, then you have many more data points to make a good judgment. So it's a bet, but you it's an educated bet, right? So I think this people is the, is the one that is the, that brings the most magic to any situation, but it's also the toughest one. Okay. Um, as, we, as we're looking forward to um, uh, the next uh, two or three years, um, how do you move transition from being the CEO of a company, 160,000 people for 15 years, how, how do you transition from that to the next phase of your, your career, the next phase of your life? Yeah, well, one thing I know is that I wanna to continue to be busy. I wanna to continue to be involved with people that I admire and can learn from, with people that share the same values that I do. Uh, and I wanna have an impact in whatever I wanna do next. So as I was telling you before this webinar started, uh, when my announcement came that I was leaving in May, in May that I was leaving at the end of June, uh, you know, people call me, you know, propose things. I said, I'll call you back. And that's what I'm doing now. July, August, September. I've been having tons of meetings, meeting very interesting people and learning what's around beer. What else in the world there is other than beer? Because for 32 years, I knew beer. And it was a great place to be. Incredible years. But now I'm like a, a kid in a, in a gift shop, you know, or in a candy shop. I'm looking, oh my God, look at all those interesting things. And, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm still in that divergence phase in that I'm getting to know people and somebody introduced me to another one and all that. At some point I'll have to start 
converting. Right. So um, Professor Major has uh, his um, strategy class um, listening into the uh, webinar and uh, they, they're submitting a lot of really interesting questions. So I'm going to move to the Q&A. Um, the first question is, um, you know, what, what are the unique characteristics of the uh, beer industry? And how did uh, the merger of AB and MBEV um, either create competitive, sustainable advantage uh, or open up uh, new opportunities? Oh, it, for us, it was a transformational business combination, as we call it. Before that, we were, we had no presence in the U.S. or hardly. In the U.S., the most profitable beer market in the world, right? We didn't have a global brand, okay, with the, with the, with the power of a Budweiser brand. And, uh, and we didn't have enough cash flow and hard currency to be able to dream, to continue to dream bigger and bigger. So in our business in China, it got a big benefit when we got together with Budweiser or Anais Bush because they had a business in China that was growing but subscale. We also had a business in China growing but subscale. When we put the two together, and that was magic. And today China is one of our top five markets. Uh, we're the most profitable brewer in China. And that's all because of that. And the US gave us the, the, the scale for us to continue to reach higher and higher. So it was a transformational deal for us. It changed our zip code as a company and it really gave us the means and the access to talent that we needed to continue to grow. When you uh, took over AB, um, how did they uh, respond to the, um, if I can put it this way, uh, the cost-cutting and zero-based budgeting philosophy that uh, characterized InBev? Yeah, I wouldn't call it cost-cutting. We always called running the business in an efficient way. And today it's interesting because today that's what everybody wants companies to do. Mm -hmm. When you look at ESG, that's what everybody says, right? I mean, how companies can have less impact in the environment. How can they use the resources they need to use in a more efficient way with less, with fewer losses, right? We've always been on that camp. So now this is cool. At some, some point, at some point in, the, in, in the last years, at some point this was out of favor, but because people misrepresented it, I think, as this thing of cost cutting, as opposed to we live, we have a business because consumers buy our products and they value certain things. In order to be able to do more of those things that they value, we need to have more what we call working dollars. In order to generate more working dollars, we need to look at the non-working dollars and ask the hard questions. Do we need to spend this money the way we're spending if consumers don't care about these things, right? So that is the whole idea. How can you be efficient? How can you cross fertilize and learn from each other? How can you use the benefits of scale as opposed to and avoid duplications? And how can you operate as one company as opposed to a collection of different companies around the world and everybody doing their own thing? How can you have a center, a headquarters that coordinate these efforts? So that's what we did. And it was different because when AB was independent, they were their company. So they had the headquarters, they had their own thing. But when we got together with us, now we had to streamline the operation because now we have our headquarters, they have theirs, so we can have two. And culture here and culture there, so we need to unify the culture and the resource allocation and criteria and all those things. So it happens when you put two companies together. But it was much more than just a optimization play. It was really a play on being a global player, having global brands, having access to talent, and they, and they have and still have we got lots of talented people coming from that combination. It was about having the right zip code. Can you uh, focus on efficiency and still be as innovative as you need to be? Of course. And that's incredible because if you read even what Amazon says, what they say, and we agree, is that frugality and the resources that are 
in, in short supply sometimes is what gets people to be creative. Okay, one thing is to be cheap. The other thing is to be frugal. We were never cheap. We we're just frugal. We just said our consumers want and value these things. So let's manage the company the most efficient way we can so we have enough money to do the things they value so they get more connected to our brands, they might buy more of our products, and then you have a flywheel because you're putting the money where it belongs. And the other thing, John, is that what you learn, and Jim Collins wrote about this in Good to Great, is that the great companies, they have this power to live with apparent contradictions because they believe in the power of the ant. They don't believe in the tyranny of the or. Or, so, or no. Or you spend a lot of money or you cannot be creative, right? No, why not? You're efficient and creative. Why can't you be both and like Amazon is, you know? That's the one great example these days. Like a startup is. A startup has very little money in the bank and they have to create a prototype to test a, a, a product market fit. And that balance in the bank is coming down every day because they still don't have something to sell. And they are being very creative with very little money. All companies started like this in a garage. No company started other than sometimes company owned by states or by, by, by governments. But companies that are owned by private individuals, they always start very small with very little money and they are very creative. <laughs> and they go against incumbents that have all the money in the world. But these guys have an idea and they are able to challenge the status quo. But they don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of resources and they still do it. Uh, here's an unusual question. Um, did you ever get to see or meet, uh, probably not ride, but did you ever get to see or meet the Clydesdale horses? Oh yeah, sure. When I was at the company, lots of events, the Clydesdales are always a mandatory presence in the opening game for the Major League Baseball, for the NBA, for 4th of July in many cities. And, you know, uh, I remember when we, when we did the combination with Anheuser-Busch in 2008, we had the Belgium ambassador in uh, DC. He offered his residence for us to have an introductory meeting to the DC, you know, society, not society, but, you know, stakeholders there, you know, and we invited them to the Belgian ambassador residence. And the Clydesdale was there in front of the residence for people to take pictures with the Clydesdale. And inside the residence, that was an amazing dinner, amazing draft beers from Belgium. That was secondary. Yeah. Everybody was lined up to take a picture of the Clydesdale. <laughs> and then, oh yeah, by the way, there's dinner, there's draft beer, Stella from Europe, you know, left uh, Who Garden, all on draft, all with beautiful glassware. The Clydesdale was the priority. Okay. So that's it. <laughs> you, you've uh, been in charge of uh, multiple acquisitions. How do you know when an acquisition is going to go well and when it's not going to go well? Well, as you said, we do a lot of planning before we, we commit to something like this. And uh, we have a toolkit because we've done it a couple of times, but we start always from the cultural fit. I mean, from what we know, because we're not inside the other company, but from what's public available information, is this company a company that we could really integrate culturally? Does it make sense strategically? Do the numbers, you know, make sense? And is it viable antitrust wise? So, I mean, you do have to do some basic things checklist wise, but uh, we do have a process. Some are easier than others, but um, we do a lot of rehearsal and a lot of scenario planning before we commit to something. What, what is your opinion of remote work? That's interesting you ask because while I was still at, at the company, you know, up until the end of June, we had our global uh, convention, it was via Zoom, unfortunately, in March, as we always do. And uh, that question came up, you know, and we're connecting, we have business in all continents. So that question came up. 
And I said, my answer continues to be the same. I said, the plan A is an office centric business because we believe in the power of people meeting. For example, John, if you remember from our office, we have no, no, nobody has an office. It's like a loft. It's a floor with no walls, just the meeting rooms. I sit on a big table with my direct reports around me. Everybody can access me. I can access everybody. It's all open. Why do we do that? Because we believe in the power of people meeting, interacting, bumping each other, and do all sorts of things. What changed is that now we know that if you, for some reason, need to work from home, that's more possible or more or easier to do than it was before because of all the technology. But this, for me, is a plan B. This is my opinion. So my opinion, plan A is the office. Plan B, if you need to work from home because you have somebody sick at home, because you are you know, colleagues that are pregnant, or no problem. That can also be dealt with in a very efficient way. But plan A is office centric. If you were to look at uh, the integration of AB and InBev, um, what percentage of the culture that emerged was contributed by AB? Or was it 100% InBev before the merger and 100% after the merger and the AB employees who could... Uh, sign on to the InBev culture survived and those who didn't wish to left? Very interesting question. Every time we do a transaction like this, you have the timing, as you know, between signing and closing. Normally it takes six months to nine months until you get all the antitrust approvals, regulators approvals around the world, different jurisdictions. And we use that time intensely uh, within the rules of what's allowed to be exchanged in between signing and closing. And one of the things we do is we go to our new colleagues in as much as we can town halls using videos and everything we could. We talk about our culture and we answer questions because we want people to know that we'll, we're gonna learn a lot from each other. And that's one of the beauty of getting two companies and putting together because you will learn best practice all over the place. But in terms of values, you know, we say those are the values that we go by. These are very simple values very basic. Again, it's about a big idea, the best people, and ownership. But every one of those very simple ideas, you can double click, and there are consequences. So if you want to have the best people, meritocracy is the name of the game. And that might be different in that other company. So we're not going to compromise on that. Because we truly believe that if everything starts and ends with people, and great people think meritocracy is important, you cannot compromise on that. But if somebody has a better idea on how to brew beer or how to use energy in a more efficient way in the brewing process, of course, we want to know about this. So the best practice will be a product of the interaction of both companies, but the culture is going to be the one that we had prior. And the lucky thing, John, at least so far, is that in all of the business combinations we've been through, the other companies... Never, never had a culture as explicit and formalized as we did. There was a culture that was there, invisible, but was very much linked to that CEO or to that founder. Mm -hmm. And when that person left, there was a vacuum because the culture was not a culture from the group, it was a culture from one person. <clears throat> that person left, the vacuum was there, we came with ours. Our culture has nothing to do with the CEO of the company. Of course, the tone from the top is very important. But the culture has to do with everybody. Everybody has to live. That's why culture ambassadorship is so important when we promote people to leadership roles. That's the first test. Is this somebody who's gonna spread our culture by personal example? Or is this somebody who's gonna cut corners? We don't want that. Because like anything in life, it takes years to build and it can destroy very easily. Like trust, like reputation, right? You take a lifetime to build and you make one bad decision, destroy it. Right, so culture is one of those things. And when you think about it, what differentiates companies? The people in the culture, that's it. Every else we can copy. What differentiate countries? The people in the culture. Think about countries in the new world, in the Americas that were, 
you know, where Europeans arrived pretty much at the same time. And look where they are 500 years later. And some of the countries have the same size, same natural resources, same everything, but developed in very different ways. How can you explain that other than people and culture? Do you consider yourself a globalist? In what sense? The companies should be responsible for helping to tackle uh, global issues. Oh yeah, no, one thing we learned time and again is this, businesses exist because society allows them to exist. So you, you always have to be seen as being part of this solution, not part of the problem. Because if you're part of the problem, you're gonna be regulated, taxed, restricted. And because your consumers and your people, us, we live in this planet, we live in that community. You have to be there where the community needs you to help solve some problem. So yes, I do believe that it, as a leader, you cannot only look at your business. You have to look at your business and the stakeholders around it. So for example, water for us, is something very important. No water, no beer, that simple. But water is something we share with the community. In which, in which we have our brewers. So we have to work together with the communities uh, to keep those water sources healthy. When there's a drought, we have to work together with them. And that's what we do. Because we want to be seen as somebody who comes to be part of the solution, not somebody that's framed as part of the problem. So yes, I do believe that companies have to not engage in every topic, but in topics where you can have a voice and an impact because of your business. So for example, for us to talk about water, farming, packaging, you know, returnable, non-returnable, plastic, and energy, we have an impact. As a company, ABI started three, four years ago with zero renewable purchase electricity. Today we are above 70%. 70%. That's good for business and good for the world. But if I was talking about the endangered species, what can I do as a beer company? So I think you have to pick the theme and society knows what's credible. When I talk about water, they know it's credible because they know I have to do it. It's good for business and good for the community. Uh, did, did AB InBev achieve water neutrality? No, not yet, but we are on our way. Okay. And we are, for example, in terms of brewers around the world, we're the ones that are most efficient in water usage. And today we're a reference in terms of ESG, in terms of brewers, because we started more than 10 years ago when the name ESG didn't even exist. It was about sustainability, it was about showing that you care about the natural resources that you're using and you're trying to use them in a very efficient way. The emergence of uh, technology and rapid progress in technology how has that changed the role or approach of the CEO in a company? Very good question. I mean, at ABI, six years ago, we decided to create what we call ZX Ventures, which was a unit within our company to deal with issues that we thought could be big in the future, could scale fast, very fast, but they were very small then, like e-commerce, the B2B, you know, portal, the, be, the direct consumer last mile solution, all those things. And luckily for us, we did it because especially during COVID, all those things grew like crazy. And today we have a couple of thousand, you know, close to 4,000 people that are writing code in the company. And 10 years ago, we had pretty much zero. So it's a big change because technology allows you to do things that before you could not even imagine to do. So for example, in Brazil today, just to give an example, you can use our app and we'll deliver beer to your doorstep in less than 30 minutes cold at grocery store prices. How can we do that? Because of geolocation, GPS, apps, we're using the retailers. So we got the, the thing, depending on your location, we direct to a, to a to a retailer that has a service level agreement with us. We read their inventory, we know what they have in store and they deliver in less than 30 minutes. So I mean, all these things are things that are not possible 
and uh, that's changing how we run the business. Uh, so one final question uh, with apologies to uh, several people whose questions I was not able to get to. Uh, but one final question from uh, one of our Brazilian undergraduate students. Um, what, what advice in this post-COVID or COVID environment would you give to a senior graduating from an undergraduate business program this year? Well, I think that the, the things that were true, basic things remain true. So I always said, choose people, not things. You know, if you choose a place to work as your first job or first enterprise outside of school, grad school, choose the people you're gonna work with, choose the values that they go by. Don't choose because of labels. You know, I, I, I chose people and culture, even having an 80% salary reduction, yeah. but because I thought that I would go further with those people in that kind of value set. So. Those basic things continue to be very true in hardworking and doing the right things and teaming up with people that are inspiring role models and uh, being ethical. All those things, COVID has not changed that. Right. Carlos, thank you very much for your uh, wisdom and uh, wishing you on behalf of our community every success in the next phase of your uh, career. Thank you, John. Thank you Great so to much. see you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us, and uh, good night from Miami.